Chairman, I can confirm the live stream has started. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon and welcome back to this afternoon's session for the final item on the agenda um, for today's committee meeting. Um, Angela, could you do a roll call, please, just to ensure we have members present? Yes. Um, I've had apologies from Councillor Creaker, who's had to leave. So right, I'll just okay. go through. So Councillor Eddie. Top of the list. Um, present. Thank you. Councillor Fitter. Present. Councillor Flashman. Present. Councillor Holly. Yeah, in full attendance, madam. Yes. Jordan. Yeah, I'm here. Councillor Simmons. Yes, present. Councillor Mould. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Pasco. Yes, present and correct. Councillor Pugh. Yeah. Councillor Tamlin. Yes, I'm here. I can see you there. Councillor Parsons and Councillor Batters has now left, so that's everybody. OK, thank you. So we'll move on to the final item on today's agenda, which is PA20 slash 05269. Um, this is at the Crooked Inn manager's dwelling, the Squad Road, Tremerton, Saltash. Um, so if I could hand over to George again, or I think it's the case officer on this to um, outline the application for us, please, George. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Parsons. Um, yep, so application PA20 forward slash 05269 at Crooked Inn. Uh, this is an application which seeks to uh, remove condition five um, of decision notice PA13 forward slash 03126, which relates to uh, an application for a manager's dwelling. So the key issue uh, is that requires addressing in the determination of this application is whether the condition continues to serve a useful purpose with regards to the development plan policies and any other material considerations. So the site is located in an elevated position in, above the line of valley. Uh, this also forms part of the Tamar Valley area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, so this is just the site plan for the site and the aerial plan. So this is just that same plan zoomed in a bit more just to explain the site to councillors. Uh, this is this is the manager's dwelling to which this application relates. Um, so residential property. You then have the Crooked Inn complex over here, which has the pub and restaurant and uh, letting rooms. And then this building here is uh, the billiards room, which is referenced within the report. Um, hopefully that will make sense to you. Um, so for the balance considerations, justification for the removal of the condition has been provided in the form of marketing. The information confirms that a genuine and robust marketing campaign at an appropriate and realistic price has failed to generate any significant interest in the property over the last 24 months. As such, notwithstanding the conflict with policy seven of the Cornwall local plan, in accordance with paragraph 55 of the National Planning Policy Framework, it is considered that condition five is unreasonable. And there are no grounds to maintain its retention. As such, officers are recommending an unconditional approval of the application. Back to you, Councillor Parsons. Thank you, George. Right, OK, we'll move on to the first of our speakers today. I think the first <coughs> one up is Councillor Mark Fox from South Ash Town Council. Are you there, Councillor Fox? Please? Yes, I am. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes and um, to which You'll be given a 30 second warning towards the end of that. So hopefully you'll be able to wrap it all up. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, at the STC planning and licensing meeting com uh, committee meeting on Tuesday, the 16th of February, we agreed to recommend refusal on the grounds that this dwelling would not have been built unless it was tied to the business, which will obviously contradict the planning legislation. If it, would be, if it were to be sold as an independent 
dwelling. We had 13 councillors in attendance on that night. Five voted to agree with the planning officer. Eight voted to maintain our original position, which was to go against the planning officer and bring this to this committee. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any um, questions from members from Councillor Fox for clarification reasons? I can't no, that, see any chairman. That looks like is it, Councillor Fox. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Line. Thank you. No Thanks, bye. Uh, okay, next speaker up is Mark Evans. Do we have Mark Evans? We do, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You have three. You have three minutes to outline what you have to say, Mr. Evans, and then you have 30 seconds uh, warning to which your time will be up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members, and then thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this application today. Um, as your professional planning officer has advised you already, paragraph 55 of the National Planning po Policy Framework confirms that planning conditions should only be imposed where they are necessary, relevant to planning and to the development to be permitted, and most importantly here, reasonable in all other respects. The professional view of your experienced planning officer is that to retain condition five is unreasonable and that this application presents the council with very robust marketing information spanning over at least two years, providing clear justification for an approval of this application in this current time. The marketing that took place following the advice received by Cornwall Council Planning Authority since the original refusal demonstrates that the business premises has continued to be marketed at a realistic price reflective of the existing planning restriction on the manager's dwelling and up to the current date. Clear evidence, including three separate independent commercial valuations, has been provided to the council. And this evidence demonstrates that the planning condition is preventing the sale of the commercial property, and that is the manager's dwelling and business as a whole. This is due to the fact that the dwelling itself is a very sizable contemporary grand design style five bedroom dwelling with an estimated value itself of just under one million pounds. This is set against the value of the commercial premises as a whole, which we have shown through three valuations is valued at just over 2.25 million pounds. The size and value of this large dwelling is therefore totally disproportionate to what you would expect of a dwelling for manager's accommodation. And due to this fact, over the last two years of active marketing, no offers have been made to purchase the property. Indeed, we have received direct feedback. This is due to the fact that no potential publican wants the financial commitment of such a large high value dwelling tied to the commercial premises as manager's accommodation. In this case, there is proportionate flat accommodation available within the existing premises to accommodate a pub manager if required. The business economic viability is a material planning consideration and in this context it is unreasonable and certainly not economically viable for the existing very large dwelling to be continued to be tied for the sole use of a pub manager. Members, in conclusion, there is clear justification for the proposal to remove condition 5 and discharge the section 106. Any attempt to resist this application by seeking to maintain the existing conditions would fail the test of paragraph 55 and regulation 122. Whilst I'm sympathetic with the Town Council's initial concerns, please note left. their recent recommendation to refuse. The Town Council's re re recommendation to refuse was not unanimous, and indeed several members, including the Chair of Saltash Town Council, voted to support approval. I hope members are clear that approval of this application is fully supported by current government guidance. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr Evans. Uh, you. Do we have any questions from members? Yeah, I, I'd like to ask in a minute. Uh, Come in, Coach the Flashman. Yeah, um, the parent field in which is the public house, is that still going to be operating? Uh, if I can answer that through you, Chair, yes, yes, I can confirm that the main um, pub, pub, pub will be re retained, yes. But Good, they can't sell it at the moment. Here. No, Thank no, it's definitely much. being kept. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mould, your hands raised. Would you like to ask your question, please? Lovely, thank you. Yeah, sorry, could you just remind me, um, when this building was marketed, was it marketed with the condition attached with that value or was it a separate val valuation as 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 open, as open market? I'm slightly confused. 
Um, through you, Chair, if you'd like me to answer that question, I can uh, confirm that it was marketed with the tie. So the values that were reflective um, of the dwelling with a you know, tied to the pub. So the valuation with the tie was how much? Sorry, can you remind me? Uh, is is uh, two, well, it's 2.5 million and bet well, between 2.25 and 2.5 million. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fitter. If you'd like to ask a question. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Um, if I could just come back on the previous answer. Um, so the, it was originally um, the whole parcel was marketed at two point five million pounds, including the house. That is correct. Uh, yes, that is correct, and including um, several acres, about ten acres of woodland as well. Right, uh, but what you're saying that separately this house is worth one million pounds. Yes, if, yeah, so, as a value of a property, um, it would be worth one, one million pounds, yes. So we're saying then that the business itself is split off, is valued at 1.5? Approximately, yes. Right, OK, thank you. Now, where um, if we move on, uh, and so this house is removed um, as a tie, where does the manager or the proprietor um, uh, live then to manage the property <coughs> premises? Um, I, I can confirm, if that's okay, that there is um, already a, um, a an apartment within the pub building itself uh, that was previously used as residential accommodation, um, and that could easily be uh, tied by planning condition if that is required. Um, again, but isn't this the one in the paperwork where you have to get um, a further condition lifted on it? Because wasn't it um, there was something about the manager's flat? and would cease to be used as a manager's flat if this house was built as a manager's accommodation? So the, so that's why this application applies to withdraw, uh, sorry, to, to change, the, well, lift this planning condition five to take that condition off. And we have offered through a section 106 agreement, you know, new wording to tie that existing flat back into um, the pub so that it won't apply to the house. But just for clarity, so I understand yep. that that is a separate separate step you have to do, isn't it? it, it it's it's um, this is a, a first step is to get this lifted and then you have to go back in uh, and seek the um, lawful right of the flat that was delisted, so to speak, to be um, listed as managed accommodation. As part of this application, if members chose to do so, they could impose a, a section 106 obligation to retain or a planning condition, in fact, could be varied on the wording to uh, tie the existing flat to the uh, planning approval that exists at the moment. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fitter. Uh, Councillor Holly, your hand is raised. Would you like to ask a question? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Sir, could you uh, tell me the, the, the manager's flat, which is above the pub, is that the one bedroom flat that you're referring to before that someone was referring to within the document, within the agenda? Um, as far as I'm aware, it's a two bedroom flat or it could at least be made into a two bedroom flat. Um, uh, I don't have the applicant with me to clarify that, but as far as I'm aware, it can be made into a two bedroom flat. OK, I'll ask the planning officer. That in a minute. Thank you. OK. Right, thank you, Mr. Evans, for those answers. That appears to be all the um, questions asked, which were listed. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time, and if you so wish, you thank can you. watch the rest on the webcast. Okay, thank Thanks you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Councillor Tamling, Sam, you yep. you're thank listed you, to speak. You have, as you know, five minutes. Yeah. Which then I'll be asking you to wind it up if you could please. Sure, okay. <coughs> um, I first became aware of the occupancy condition on this building when the owners of the site applied to remove the condition and discharge the section 106 agreement in 2019. When the original application was approved in 2013, policy prevented new unencumbered sporadic de developments in the countryside. A planning condition was deemed necessary to limit the occupation to a manager's dwelling and a section 106 agreement was also required to prevent the separate sale of the premises and prevent the occupation of the existing flat in addition to the new dwelling. The reasoning for this was that without these conditions, the application would have resulted in two dwellings on the site, which had not been justified. 
It seems that the manager's dwelling is still in existence, despite not being occupied for several years, and the applicant proposes that this is now sufficient accommodation as circumstances have changed. This would result in the additional dwelling that the Section 106 agreement was specifically drawn up to prevent. Paragraph 55 of the MPAPF is being used to justify the removal of the condition, as conditions must be reasonable. In my opinion, the condition is just as reasonable now as it was in 2013, and in fact, we would require the same conditions if it came forward today. The estate agent has said that the ratio of value between the house and the business is not favourable for sale, but this has not changed since the condition was originally imposed. The dwelling is a significant building, and I can see why it would make the sale of the business difficult, but this has not changed since 2013, when the condition was imposed and the Section 106 agreement was signed. Um, paragraph 56 of the MPPF says that the planning obligations must only be sought when necessary to make the development acceptable. It clearly wasn't acceptable without an occup occupancy condition in 2013, and I don't believe a new application of this nature would be acceptable now without a similar condition, and it's such a large dwelling, I question if it would be acceptable at all. I mentioned the applications to remove the condition in sec uh, and section 106 in 2019. Both were refused for the same reasons. I agreed with the reasons for the refusals then, and I believe the application to be refused for the same reasons now. The dwelling is an isolated, is in an isolated open countryside location that isn't acceptable for unrestricted res residential development, and it conflicts with policy seven of the local plan in paragraph 79 of the MPPF. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tamley. Do we have any questions of clarification for the divisional member? If not, we'll move back to George for questions of the case officer. Do we have any? Councillor Holly, please come thank in. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Th thank you for that. Um, George, my question about the flat. I'm concerned that um, you're in, in the documents it says it's a one bedroom flat. I'm concerned that if we allow this application, that means that any future manager would reside in that. But what if there's a manager with a family, as you might reasonably expect? Um, and clearly, a one bedroom flat would not be suitable. I know that the uh, applicants' agents made a comment about um, being dividing up the bedroom to make two, but I want the before I could support this, and I'm doubtful anyway, before I could support this, I would need assurance that um, there is proper accommodation for a manager on site so that there is not a further application coming in for a new building for a manager at some later date, which is what I can foresee. So how can you answer that, please, George? Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, these are, these are considerations which we thought of when forming our recommendation. Um, and yeah, it's our understanding that the, the flat which is being used, uh, currently being used as as kind of the on duty manager accommodation, um, was explicitly prevented from being used for that purpose by the section 106, but has since been continued to be used for that purpose. Um, yeah, in in terms of um, possible future applications, yes, that is a possibility, and and we would just have to consider that um, as and when and if that application was ever submitted, uh, if it was for a larger family and they needed more accommodation than, than is available in the current, current manager's flat, then, then we would have to look at that. We'd potentially have to look at if um, other accommodation could be utilised within the existing letting rooms. Um, and we'd obviously be mindful of the fact that the previous manager's dwelling um, was no longer that as well. Um, so we would just have to assess it as and when that application came in. Can I, Mr Chairman, can I ask a further question? Um, would that be acceptable because there isn't a, a, at the moment a suitable manager's flat because a one bedroom flat is clearly not suitable for a manager with a family. Because there's not a suitable one manager's flat, would that be reasonable grounds for refusal? Um, it's I guess it's a consideration. I think that the manager's accommodation that that can be used, although I, I believe is prevented by the section 26, it provides enough accommodation for an on duty manager. So the ability for a manager to be present effectively 24 hours a day on site. Um, 
it's slightly different when you're talking about um, a manager who who runs and operates and lives on the site uh, permanently. I guess that's that's slightly different, but there's certainly considerations that we can take into account when um, yeah forming a view on the application and the need for man managers accommodation at the complex. But you see where I'm coming from, George. My concern is that we allow this, but then another application comes in. I know we've got to judge it on its merits, et cetera, et cetera. But I think another a suitable accommodation had to be made before this application came in. And I don't think the current accommodation proposed is suitable, not for a man with a family. Thank you. Right, thank you. Councillor Fitter, you're next on the list. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Smiley, sir, um, I, I just want to check that the, 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 the property has to be advertised or the business has to be advertised um, for six months, I believe, or longer. And I understand they've been saying it's been two years. But the, um, the, the, the it's been paragraph 32 says it's a confidential marketing exercise. So have you actually seen the figures and, and, and the package in which this business was being offered? Yeah, so we so we we raised this with um, with the applicants, and I think I've set out in the report the reasons why uh, the applicants and on I guess on the advice of their marketing agent decided to go down a conf confidential sale route. Um, it's it's apparently not um, unusual for that to happen, especially with businesses that are operating um, in order to effectively not scare staff off that the business is, is going to be sold and, and employees are going to lose their jobs. Um, and yeah, also to, to prevent prospective purchasers perhaps um, turning up unannounced and doing informal site visits. So I think we would um, probably prefer a, a kind of a, a, a full fronted and sort of um, open sale but we accept the reasonings behind the confidential sale. Um, it's something which happens from time to time. Um, we've seen appeal inspectors accept it on other um, marketing exercises. So I think we're content that it's it's reasonable enough uh, for the purposes of considering whether it's a robust marketing campaign. But you see, this is what calls me concern. You may be content and inspectors may be content, but the local council obviously has concern. The local member, Councillor Tamlin, has justifiably concern. And, and we're being asked to take this, and this is not through you, sir, but we're asked, we're asked to take this on blind faith, you know, that we, we don't know what. And of course, um, if, if they were, you know, wishing to sell the business as a whole, then there may be a devil's advocate view that, you know, you've got to be realistic and mark down the price of the manager's house to get the business underway. But if you're going to reflect that value, very high value of a million pounds in the overall value of the sale of the business, then it may well be a problem in getting somebody on board. So you may well have to say, OK, we're going to have to drop the notional value of this house to affect the sale of the business. It seems that reading from what I can see here is that um, the, 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 and I suppose it's, they would want that with it, they would want it, I suspect, but the applicant is seeking to maximise his profit at the expense of getting a justifiable condition lifted. Uh, and, you, you know, um, I find this very difficult to, to, to go along with, quite frankly, but um, I'll wait for the debate. But I'm, I'm far from happy because I think this is, this is smokes and mirrors and we are sort of um, behind the mirror and in front of the smoke. Thanks very much indeed, sir. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Pugh, Richard, come in. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. George, on page 80, uh, it says the, the in determination of this application is whether the, the condition continues to serve a useful purpose. Um, Presumably, you've decided that it doesn't continue to use a, be a useful purpose. Is that what you've done? Yeah, we, we, we need we need to make a judgment of whether or not the uh, condition and the Section 106 agreement, which effectively replicates um, the requirements of, of the condition, um, yeah, whether it serves a useful purpose and whether it remains reasonable 
um, as, re as we're required to do by paragraph 55 of the MPPF. So in assessing whether or not the condition remains reasonable and serving a useful purpose, we then go through this this kind of marketing exercise and that's that's how we then come out with our conclusion that it is um, yeah no longer reasonable. Can I come back Mr Chairman? Yeah certainly. Yeah. Okay what I understand about this then is that I've got I've recently had several holiday accommodation places that have a number of letting units and so for them to sell their business on, they would love to divide it up, but they've had to pay an enormous amount of money to actually get this decided that they can actually split it up. And this is just going to be given to these people with no payment, no nothing of, of how and why should we do that? I'd, with, with the people I've been dealing with, they, they, they're, they're at their wits end trying to sell. Chairman, can I come in on that, please? It's Davina, because I think I know the case possibly or the cases that Richard is referring to. So, Richard, the situation um, in relation to those cases was slightly different in as much as they were holiday occupancy conditions whereby applicants are seeking to turn holiday units into residential units, whereby we collect the community infrastructure levy on certain cases where it meets thresholds, whereas this application is for removal of an occupancy condition on a single single dwelling. Um, so it, it, we wouldn't be looking to collect the community infrastructure levy, levy in the same way because it wouldn't meet the thresholds. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'd have to disagree with you slightly on that because it, it wasn't the community infrastructure levy, it was actually for affordable homes at the time. But I mean, I, I can't, I can't get to grips with the fact that we just give this to one person and we, we don't do it to others and uh, there's a I lot of places out there that have got conditions. Yeah if I could come in I think we've got to be careful that we don't kind of confuse the situation with different applications um, but I think, I, I think we can see where you're coming from Richard. Do you have any other questions Richard? Councillor Pugh. Hello, Councillor Pugh. No, I'm fine, thank you. Are you okay? Sorry yeah. for biting it. I just think we're kind of going off track a little, but that's fine. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mould. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, sorry, someone's got a phone going. On page um, 81, I just need to understand a bit of the history of this site because it appears that there was a dwelling on this site which was ruined by fire and for 20 years what is now the billiard room sat there on its own and then am I correct in thinking that the building that is there now with the condition on it was effectively that replacement building or have I got the wrong end of the stick there George? Yeah um, let me let me just flick back to yeah okay so this is a site plan so um yeah so so there used to be a uh, I believe it was called Stoketon Manor uh, quite a large dwelling um, in a similar position to where the current one is now. I, I think effectively it was attached to the billiard room here. So the fire, so the property was was extensively damaged by fire. The property was demolished, albeit apart from the billiard room, which then remained and, and just became um, uh, a detached building on its own. Uh, yet yeah, then for many years, uh, whatever the length of time it's, it's set out in a report uh, there was there was nothing on the site as far as I'm aware other than the, the billiards room and, and the Crooked Inn was um, kind of operating as it was um, and then yeah in, in in 2010 I believe was the was the first application to um, construct the manager's dwelling um, that wasn't applied for at the time that wasn't applied for as a replacement dwelling because there had been no dwelling on that site to replace for many years. In our eyes, the the residential use of that site had ceased. Um, ah, right, that's where I was trying to get to. Okay, that's answered my question. Thank you very much. That's okay. Thank you. Right, thank you. I think Councillor Flashman, were you trying to come in? Yeah, um, I've had a few similar instances with uh, conditions on agricultural, uh, affordable housing especially, 
where no, there were no takers, and eventually the affordable um, condition that was on these properties had been removed, and also Holiday Park um, chalets that have been uh, conditioned taken off, but they had to go back through building regs and to strengthen the buildings before they were allowed to be sold as open market housing. Um, is there enough structure in the uh, planning officer's report to rebust any appeal made against us if we decide to approve it? Sorry, Jim, I'm, I'm not quite sure what question you're asking there. We, we, yeah, we're confident in our recommendation. Was there, is there yeah. a specific point there? Yeah, the, if, it, if we say for argument's sake now that we decided to refuse this, is there a strong enough application, um, a strong enough appeal to fight it? I, d I don't know if Davina, do you want to jump in here? Yep, yeah, certainly. So I think this case obviously presents quite a difficult balance of consideration and it's something that as officers we've struggled with a lot as well. Um, on face value, you have a dwelling here that was first granted consent in 2010. It's not that old. It's a very large dwelling. Um, arguably, perhaps some more consideration should have been given at the time to how large it was, but we are where we are. And um, we've now got an application in to remove the occupancy condition um, with evidence in the form of marketing for 24 months with independent valuations to support the price that it's been marketed at. I think we would probably struggle to defend an appeal um, for refusal. I think, however, if members were minded to refuse it, um, probably the area that you need to focus on are the comments sort of raised by Councillor Fitter about the confidential nature of the marketing conducted in combination with the high price point of, that the property was advertised at. I would suggest if you're looking to make an argument to refuse it, then that's probably where you need to focus your attention. It is, it's a very difficult case. And as I said, we've grappled with it for quite some time. It's a balanced recommendation that we've put forward. We're not entirely comfortable with the situation, but it, it, the applicant has gone to some extensive measures to, um, to try and market and dispose of the property without success. So we, we feel we would struggle to defend a refusal and that's where we are, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you, Davina. Is is that it, Councillor Flashman? Any more questions? No, that's it for a minute. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Holly. I see you've raised your hand again. Is that for another question? Yeah, it, is. it is. Thank you. It's for Davina or one of the planning officers, please. Um, I am minded because I'm not satisfied with the explanation about the alternative accommodation. I'm minded to defer this to give the applicant a chance to make a proposal for a proper members proper manager's accommodation which would satisfy the needs going into the future. Uh, do you think that's a reasonable deferment, Mr. Chairman and Davina? What um, do you think, Davina? I'm not entirely convinced it is, but you may I think I think Derek, I understand your point. Um and I think, and I don't think it's an unvalid point at all. I think what we probably need to look at is the the accommodation at, 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 the, at the site at the moment in terms of the, man, the, the duty manager's accommodation, so this small flat, together with the rest of the accommodation at the premises, so the holiday accommodation, is relatively extensive. So in all likelihood, accommodation, satisfactory accommodation could be formed within that building. So on that basis that there's a reasonable likelihood of, of an, such an application being able to be put forward and, and I, I'm not sure how reasonable it would be to defer it and just insist on, on that application coming forward. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr Chairman. So can I ask you, Davina, what's to stop the um, this applicant or any future applicant saying that they need all of the existing residential accommodation for holidaymakers, et cetera, to make the business viable. The manager's flat is not satisfactory. We need to buy, build another one. It, it, it's difficult, isn't it? And I think as George has said, and as you all know, without repeating the mantra too often, it's each case on its own merits. But 
a part of a planning consideration in these circumstances can be the planning history of the site and whether there has indeed been some kind of abuse of the planning mm. system in, in the relatively sort of recent past. Um, and that is, a that is a consideration that we have had to look at before in respect of agricultural workers dwellings where agriculture type properties have been sold off and then applicants have come in for further accommodation later on down the road. So it is it is a concern, um, Councillor Holly, um, and I can't tell you what the outcome will be because we'd have to assess it on its merits at the time and based on the circumstances of the case. Um, but what I can say is that the planning history and the course of events that have happened would form a material consideration. OK. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank would you. It, would it be, my last question. Would it be appropriate for me to ask the applicant whether he will be prepared as a condition to accept that the manager's flat is extended to make it suitable for a manager and his family? Um, through you, Chair, I'm going to let I'm going to let George answer this um, in its entirety because he knows the details of the case, but. I think in terms of this decision, obviously this is an application for removal of condition in relation to the new dwelling. I don't think the red line area for, for, for the original application extended as far as the Crooked Inn and the, and the manager's accommodation within the main fabric of the pub and the holiday accommodation. So I don't believe we could impose such a condition on this permission, but I will let George answer that because he'll know the history in more detail than me. Yeah, yeah. As you said, Davina, um, the red line doesn't in, it only encompasses um, the manager's dwelling. It doesn't encompass the whole of the red site. So I think it would be difficult to to look at imposing a condition on land which is outside um, the red line boundary. Yeah, thank you, George. In that case, I have no uh, no alternative but to recommend refuse when it comes to. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. It appears we have no more hands raised for people listed to speak. So if that no. is the case, we'll, come in. we'll go into. Is that another question, Jim, or for open debate? Open debate. Oh, yeah, hold on. Yeah, we'll move there. So we'll move into open debate. I would just like to add a few comments that um, although I find this a very regrettable application and I suspect most of the rest of the committee do from what's being said. <coughs> um, I fear though that the mistakes have been made in the past, possibly by our planning department in allowing two grand uh, managers house to be built in conjunction with this pub. Um, I just I can't fathom out for the life of me why we have such a great if it was an agriculturally tied property you you would have expected something more modest to be in place to um, be more preventative of this type of thing happening uh, as we've seen with other pubs and conditions and types of applications in the past all too often we because we don't like it we refuse it and then we find we give it another six months of marketing exercise and it comes back and we we fold up and we lose. Um, so to me, I, it just feels like if we refuse, we're kicking the can down the road. And I honestly, I'm not sure what we're going to gain by making this property marketed for a longer period of time, because when you just look at the values in the mix, I'm just not sure that it will ever stack up and somebody will come in and buy it as a viable business. But having said that, I'll I'll stop there and I'll invite Councillor Fitter, your hands raised. Come in, please, John. Um, I was first, wasn't I? Well, uh, let Councillor Fitter go, Jim, and then we'll have you in, OK? Right. If Councillor Fitter isn't there, Jim, you can fire away. Right. Um, Carry on. I, I'm going to go along with the chairman of Saddash Town Council and recommend approval. Sorry, could you... you your recommend... A recommended you, approval. With officer's recommendation, is that? Yeah. Right, okay. 
you want me to come in now? Mr. Yeah, Chairman? come in, Councillor okay. Finner, please. Um, yeah, um, I certainly would not be um, recommending this um, application for approval. We've been down this road so many times, and it's not only um, you, sir, as a farmer, will be aware of the many times when um, farmhouses have to come forward to lift the conditions, etc. And we've had to be really persuaded that there is a just cause. Quite frankly, here, that you know, they, they, the applicants went into. In, in, in their own sort of way, you know, they went into it with a clear mind, they knew what they were doing, uh, and this is a house in the open countryside. We would not have permitted it unless it had a tie to this development, the pub and the accommodation that goes with it. Uh, and the fact of, you know, the manager's flat will be too small for him or maybe um, he might have, that's beside the way. We will have a development in the open countryside um, the sale is, as the officer points out, is in conflict with policy seven, but more important in policy paragraph 55 of the MPPF, which I quickly had a look at, and it says, agreed conditions early is beneficial to all parties involved in the processing and speed up decision making. Well, that's what was happening. It was an agreed position. Suddenly it cannot now change. And if the applicant is really determined to sell, then they have to do it at what the site as a whole is worth. And it may be the crooked inn with this rather nice manager's accommodation is worth half the money that they hope to get. But that's the way the cookies crumbles. In the meantime, we if we give approval to this, we will be opening up a, a can of worms, I think. And it's certainly not a sustainable location. And it's um it's outside any settlement, isn't it? As so they say. And it has to remain attached and tied to that business. And so that is why I think that the officers in the beginning were quite right to make sure it was tied, whether it was too large. I, I, funnily enough, I don't know where the picture came from that we, we showed the site, but I see there's a car parked in the front drive. So it's, it was in use whenever that picture was taken. And um, I think it has to remain that tied to the business. And in the end of the day, somebody will come along and offer a price which the applicants will say, right, OK, fair enough, take it. But in the meantime, you know, we cannot allow people to make a profit out of something which was not intended to be. And that is an un, a, a, a un, um, unmarketed house in a, in, a, in a protected location. But anyway, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Fitter. Councillor Jordan, your hand is raised. Please come in. Yes, I've listened to everything. I heard what uh, Davina said and you couldn't defend this on appeal. So I'm going to second Jim uh, along with re uh, officer's recommendation. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mould. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I have to fully agree with Councillor Fitter. We see this all the time and it, it fits, doesn't it? Well, I'll accept a condition and then I can build this building and I'll have a condition. And then when it time when it suits me, I'll come back and ask for it to be lifted so I can sell it off. And then the next thing we know, it's sold off. And then somebody else comes back. Oh, well, we've got a business. It's not viable. We can't make it viable without an extra building. This is such a, an old occurrence that goes on and on. I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot support it. You've got a condition. You, that's the only reason you've got the, the building there with this condition and I really cannot agree to lifting it because it would be a house in the open countryside and um, and, I, and I just cannot support it. Thank you Councillor Mould. We don't have anybody else listed with hands raised to speak. Is there anybody else who would like to add to this debate? Councillor Hawley. Come in. Yeah, just to say, Mr. Chairman, I said at the end of my questioning is that without some assurance that um, the manager's accommodation is satisfactory for a manager and his family, which is reasonable, I think, then, uh, you know, as an alternative to this large building, then I could not possibly support it. And if it comes to it, perhaps Councillor Fitto at the right time would add that to his objection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Simmons, your hands raised. Please come yes, in. thank you, Chairman. Um, but I have this all the time in my division where we we have boat houses being built, and we put an application to say it's tied to the building because it's near the river. They then build the boat house with a little flat on top, have the condition lift, 
lift it and then sell it separate. It, as Councillor Fitter said, how many times have we seen this? And uh, I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to support it either. OK, thank you. Right, as nobody else has their hands raised, we do have a proposer in Councillor Flashman and we have a seconder in Councillor Jordan to proceed in line with officer's recommendation. I don't know, do, George and Davina, would, is there anything you'd like to add that would perhaps satisfy Councillor Holly or carry on as we are? I don't think there's anything I'd like to add, Chairman. I think everything's been said that needs to be said, really. Thank you. Right, yeah, thank you. Likewise from me as well. Thank you, George. Right, if that's the case, Angela, could we ask you to take the vote, please? OK, so this um, vote is for approval. For approval. Yeah, Councillor Eddy. Against. Fitter. Councillor Fitter. He seems to have dropped off the list. I'll have to check him again in a minute. Councillor Flashman. Or. Councillor Holly. Against. Councillor Jordan. For. Councillor Simmons. Against. Councillor Mould. Against. Councillor Pascoe. Against. Councillor Pugh. Against. Councillor Parsons. For. And I'll just go back to Councillor Fitter. I've just looked through the list and we've lost Councillor Fitter. So um, I'll just uh, um, count these votes up a moment. OK, so the um, vote for approval has failed by si uh, three votes in favour, six against and no abstentions. So we now have nothing on the table. Right, OK. The police chairman. Was that you want your name recorded, Councillor Flashman? Yeah. Is, uh, can, yeah, OK, OK. And the fact that there was vote was six that in that difference it made no difference that councillor fitter dropped out right if that's the case we need can we try and get hold of councillor fitter please in council or councillor tamlin councillor right. tamlin has um is the local member so yeah. he councillor tamlin okay. can come in but um is there anything you would like to put forward councillor holly well in in the absence of can we just try councillor fitter once more it does do seem. Speaker, do you want to adjourn the meeting for a moment while I? Yeah, can... I think we ought to adjourn to get Councillor Fitter back Absolutely, because it's yes, just not okay. very fitting. Should we? Uh, should we give it five minutes? Yeah, if you could give me five minutes. Adjourn for five minutes. If everybody could make their cameras off and mute, please.
I've just spoken to Councillor Holly and he left lost connection, so he's going to try calling in. Um, yeah. If he had been present, he would have voted um, against the approval, but that wouldn't have um, made any difference. No, just to clarify, that's Councillor Fitter, Angela, not Councillor Holly. Yes, sorry, Councillor Fitter. Yeah. yeah, he's just going to try and call in, so if we could hold on a moment. Right. Um, I'll admit him as soon as he comes through. If he can't, I think we should give him a minute or two. Yeah, I think we should try and proceed. It's all stopping it. Yeah. Hang on a bit. Mr. Chairman, I think that there have been dodgy connections around this morning because there have been long gaps while we waited for people. So I don't think it's Councillor Fitter's fault necessarily. Hello. Hello, is that you, Councillor Fitter? Yeah, it is indeed. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, we're ready to carry on now. Uh, we're at the point where we've got nothing on the table. Okay, right, thank um, you, Hansen. Uh, Mr Chairman, I could apologise to you. Um, unfortunately, for some obscure reason, um, my computer and my email, my portal just went down. And when I tried to get on, it says Axel to the portal denied. So, obviously, That's absolutely <laughs> fine. I don't know if you understand what yes, happened. I understand where you are, sir. And I think in view of the fact that I've, I would have certainly voted against that application, sir. But in view of my absence, I'd be more than happy to pass over to Councillor um, Holly and I would be happy to second any um, proposal that he make, likes to make, sir. Right, thank you for that. Councillor Holly, would you like to come in? Well, I'd like to do it on two fronts. First of all, the reasons which Councillor Fitter gave, which were best explained um, by the planning officer, <laughs> sorry, I can't remember the exact wording, and my concerns at the Councillor flat, which is the substitute as a manager's dwelling for this manager's dwelling being taken off this, is adequate, which I don't think it is. So, um, Davina, can you, or George, can you um, remind me what Councillor Fitter put, how he put it? Um, yep, certainly. So I've, I've just put something together on that basis, okay. um, which I'm just going to read out. It's a bit off the hoof, so you just have to bear with me. Um, so something along the lines of um, the information submitted has failed to demonstrate that the permitted manager's accommodation is no longer required where the confidential nature of the marketing conducted in combination with the high price point the property was advertised has failed to convincingly demonstrate the condition restricting the use of the dwelling as managers accommodation only is unreasonable and unnecessary with reference to the requirements of paragraph 55 of the MPPF. The proposal would therefore effectively result in the creation of an open market dwelling in an unsustainable location contrary to policies one, three and seven of the Cornwall Local Plan. What about my bit? I'm just thinking how we can weave that in. Um, we could weave in there um, a sentence that says or that there is sufficient um, space uh, within the within the existing um, complex to accommodate managers accommodation. Yeah, um, you don't think it's reasonable to refer to a manager and his family? I think we don't know the circumstances, Councillor Holly. Um, you, you, you could, it, you you could have somebody there that doesn't have a family that is happy to live in 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 a, in a one bedroom property. You could have somebody with a family take it over. So I think it's difficult for us to to judge okay. what may happen in terms of who who takes it over. So I think it's it's better just to leave it a little bit looser in that sense. Okay. Thank you. As you said, then thank you. In that, in that case, Mr. Chairman, the wording which Davina has very thank thank you, Davina has given. Thank you, Davina. Right. You are happy with that? Okay. Well, yeah. if that's the case, we have no other hands raised, and we Mr. have. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, could I just come in to say that I am now reconnected, sir? They've now reconnected me, so I'm, right. not, I'm okay. not on the telephone anymore. Just to make sure. Thank right. You. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fitter. Right, if that's the case, we now have a second recommendation on the table to go against officers' recommendations proposed by Councillor Holly and seconded by Councillor Fitter with the reasons which Davina has just given. If we could go over to you, Angela, to take the vote again, please. Yeah, yeah. 
Councillor Eddy. Four. Councillor Pitter. Four. Councillor Flashman. Again. Councillor Holly. Four. Councillor Jordan. Against. Councillor Simmons. Four. Councillor Mould. Four. Councillor Pasco. Four. Councillor Hugh. Councillor Pugh? Yeah, just, just a second. Four. Councillor Parsons? Against. Okay, I'll just count that up. I can confirm that the refusal has been carried by seven votes in favour and three against. Right, thank you, Angela. Thank you, we've got there. That today wraps up the proceedings. I thank you all for those who have stayed for the course of the day. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add unless anybody has any other business which I don't think is listed. So um, if I could just ask everybody to mute and turn the cameras off until the, we have notification that the live stream is finished, please. Thank you.